Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this month's topic for It Takes a Village with Marvelous Minds is predict the unpredictable. Prepare your child for back to school. So I think most schools have started now. So you guys sent in some great questions. I was trying to feed them to Dr. Larson as they come, came in. A bunch came in kind of at the end there. So um, I'm just gonna do the best you can to respond to all of your questions. So without further ado, take it away, Dr. Larson. All right, thank you, Melissa. Um, so we are going to be talking today about what we can do to help our kids and our teens um, not only go back to school, but how to help them through difficult transition periods, how to build resilience, how to build cognitive flexibility. So these are, um, these are some of the things that we want to make sure that we are fostering in our kids. The past 18 months have been really crazy because we haven't really known what to expect. Things have been changing constantly. Um, and why that's important is not knowing what to expect is very stressful for most people. And it's one of the most common triggers for anxiety. And that's the kind of anxiety that everybody has at some point in their life. And also clinical anxiety, the type of anxiety that um, brings somebody in for treatment. Okay. So, oops. Okay, if you guys have seen me before, you know I cannot control my slides or my fingers, so I apologize in advance. Um, so what can we do to, to mitigate the effects of change on our kids? Number one, we want to model self-care and being our best selves, right? If we're constantly being stressed out because we don't know what's going on, our kids are going to, they're going to see that that's going to become their normal and they're going to be doing the same thing. Um, so we really want to do our best to present our best selves and most regulated selves to the kids. We want to prioritize sleep, nutrition, and movement. If we're not taking care of our bodies, then we cannot um, be our best mental or emotional selves either. We want to encourage a healthy mindset. This is positivity. This is resilience building. Um, we want to make sure that we are doing what we can to, to stay positive for our kids and um, to, to make sure that they have the skills that they need to stay positive also. We want to schedule regular family time. More than anything, this is as much time as we've been spending with our families through quarantine in the, you know, in the past 18 months and people working from home and kids doing school from home, that doesn't necessarily mean that we've had more quality family time. And I'm talking about the fun stuff. This is sitting down and playing a game together. This is going on a bike ride together. This is going to the park or having a picnic. This is the fun stuff. We want to make sure that we schedule that. And while we're talking about schedules, one of the best things that we can do to build resilience in our kids and to help them get through transitions is to have a consistent schedule. That means bedtimes are consistent. That means wake times are consistent. They know what to expect. Again, if we go back to here, we remember that not knowing what to expect is the major cause of anxiety, okay? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're keeping a consistent schedule. Similar to that is the idea that everything has a place. It's really stressful when you're running around in the morning and you don't know where your shoes are or you can't find your trombone or whatever it is that you're supposed to have in the moment, if we know where everything is, we can reduce a lot of stress, especially in those morning routines and bedtime routines. And then finally, as I've already talked about, um, building resilience. That is one of the best things that we can do for ourselves and for our kids. So today we're gonna to talk about each of these areas here a little bit more in depth. 
All right, how to win at parenting. If you guys have um, heard me talk before, you are going to have heard these points. I think that's a good thing. Repetition is key. These are really like, Bottom line, if, if you can reduce positive parenting down into, in, into a couple nuggets, it's these. We want to define expectations. The kids need to know what to expect. What are they supposed to do? Are they allowed to say certain words? Are they allowed to take a snack when they want to, right? What are the house rules? And also along with that, or what are the consequences? If they don't follow the expectation, what's the consequence gonna be? And this isn't necessarily a punishment. This is a consequence for a behavior, a consequence of being a really good big brother and, and helping your younger sibling out of the toy box when he fell in, right? You would have a consequence for that because you would give that child some additional reinforcements, maybe a hug, maybe a, hey, way to go, you're the best big brother around. You know, maybe even a little treat or extra iPad time or something, right? So consequences are just that, neither positive nor negative, but a consequence for an action. Follow through. If you say you're going to do something, you should do it which means we have to really filter ourselves because we don't want to get into the situation where we are threatening um, to do something we have no intention of following through, right? Um, I'm canceling our Disneyland trip next year. Eh, you probably don't want to be threatening something like that, right? You can threaten things like, I'm going to take away your iPad if you um, talk that way again, right? Or... Um, you know, if, if you use that word again, we're going to have some soap in the mouth, right? Those are, those are consequences that are easy to follow through on. You wanna be consistent, super important. Um, if something's a rule, it's a rule. You don't want to get into the, the place where sometimes it's okay to do this and sometimes it's not because then the kids aren't gonna know what is to be expected. And that's also the time when they will take that little difference and push it and push it and push it and push it. And so then they're driving you nuts trying to, um, trying to bend the rules for them because it happened that one time. So why can't it happen again? So we really want to make sure that we're being consistent with our parenting. Having a sense of humor is absolutely necessary. Kids are weird. They do weird things. And if you can't laugh at some of the craziness that happens as a parent, then you're gonna be miserable because parenting is really, really hard. And sometimes we need to just step back and, and enjoy the moment and just say, well, that was weird, right? And enjoy a little bit of the crazy. We also need to make sure that we're keeping ourselves regulated. Um, we, all have moments where maybe we behave a little bit like a toddler. I have stomped my foot and yelled at my kids before. Um, not my best moment, right? But it happens. So we want to make sure that we are not only teaching ourselves skills to keep ourselves regulated, um, but that we're practicing those things. And when we make a mistake, own it. Mommy didn't just make her best decision right now. I, I shouldn't have stomped like that. I shouldn't have yelled. I'm sorry. I got a little carried away, right? We're modeling for them that we make mistakes. We're modeling for them that um, an apology is warranted when we make mistakes. And that brings us to the last point here is modeling the behaviors that you want to increase, right? If you want your child to not sit on the phone, when you're talking to them, don't sit on your phone when you're talking to them, right? If it's a phone-free um, dinner time, right? Then you shouldn't have your phone either. Not to say that every rule has to pertain to parents as well as children, but we really wanna be mindful of the example that we're setting for them. And now I can't move my slide. 
<laughs> at all. All right. So the next thing on our list was prioritizing sleep, nutrition, and movement. Um, this was a uh, an entire presentation that I did actually last month. So we won't get too deep into it. If you have questions, let me know um, at the end. And I've got lots more information on these, but just a couple basics. When you're setting your schedule for the kids, start with sleep. I had a conversation with a family um, yesterday and they were concerned that their child was doing homework until two o'clock in the morning. And I asked them what, what the priority was, if it was get, you know, like taking care of their body or if it was doing the homework. And they said, well, they need to do them both, right? Which is true, but we were working towards getting that homework earlier in the day so that it doesn't interfere with sleep. So when we're starting our schedules, when we're working with our kids on executive functioning, things like time management, when to do your homework, how to do your homework, start at the end of the night. If you need to be in bed by 10 o'clock and you have two and a half hours of homework a night for a high schooler or 20 minutes for uh, a younger child, right? Let's, let's plan that. Let's make sure that we build all those things into the schedule. But start with sleep, especially for the older kids, because we don't want that homework time to interfere with sleep. Taking care of their bodies should be the priority. You want to fuel your bodies with good and whole foods, right? Junk food is just that. It's junk. It's a treat. It's not the staples, right? We, we want to make sure we're filling them up with the good stuff, and then they can have a treat. Um, schedule movement time for the whole family. Again, this can be a bike ride. This can be a hike. This can be, um, you know, if it's raining, we've had some pretty crazy weather lately. This could be one of those like we fit games. Um, somewhere in the slides, I have a, um, a link for you guys that is a, it's a list of like the top 15 video games that build um, physical activity in. So sometimes we can't get away from the screen. Sometimes we can't get out of the house, but that doesn't mean we have to be motionless. Um, and a lesson for parents, as well as for our kids, there is no need for perfection. There is no such thing as perfection. Just do your best. Do your best at getting them to bed on time. Do your best at filling them with, with good, healthy foods. It's okay to have junk sometimes, right? Just do your best. It's okay if you don't exercise every day. I don't exercise every day, but I do my best at trying to get it in a couple times a week, right? Just do your best. All right. <laughs> okay, let's try that again. Here we go. So how much sleep does your child need? Um, these are the latest recommendations from the um, International Sleep Disorder Group. Um, I should have that on the slide. I don't. Um, but everything from newborns to older adults, how much sleep is needed. Most of our kids, um, mo most of you that are watching, I would imagine, have kids somewhere between preschool and high school. So we're talking about, you know, 10 hours of sleep, give or take, okay? It's really, really important that we get them enough sleep. Most people do not get enough sleep. We need to try changing now. As far as nutrition, how do we know what's healthy? Take those public service announcements with a grain of salt. They, um, they change every few years. And so it's really hard to kind of know what to do. In general, think about natural, whole, unprocessed foods, right? Don't cut out a category of food. We need proteins. We need fats. We need carbohydrates, right? We need our vitamins and minerals. Um, the less processed your foods are, the closer to their natural state that they are, the better they're going to be for you.
exercise. So um, this is where this is where we can really have some fun. We can teach our kids like old school games like ghost in the graveyard or kickball or you know things like that and, and do it together as a family. We all need exercise. Um, you know, walking the dog, going on a bike ride, doing a yoga video, making up games. Your kids are so creative and so fun. Have you ever like really listened to the, the games that they make up to play with each other? They're, they're delightfully ridiculous. Play them with them, right? Add in some movement, some activity and, and just get silly and have fun. Here is that link um, that I was talking about earlier. Um, it's from thegamer.com and it's fitness video games um, that are actually have actual fitness in them. All right, moving right along. Encouraging a healthy mindset. So this, this is a really important part of building resilience and cognitive flexibility. One of the first things we wanna do as parents is when our child comes to us with a problem or a complaint, is to validate their feelings. It's almost reflexive as a parent to, to minimize our kids' hurt, right? We, we want to tell them they're, they're okay, they're going to be fine, right? Like, like it comes naturally to say something like that, but that doesn't actually help. We want to say something like, oh, that's really hard. That's not, that sounds like that was a, a, a really icky experience or, or that really sucks, man. I, I'm so sorry that your friends did that, right? We want to validate the feelings that they're having. This is so important. In fact, this should probably go up on my, my winning at parenting slide um, that I use everywhere because it is that important. Our kids need to know that they're being heard and that they're being acknowledged and that what they're saying is valid. Super, super important. We also wanna make sure that we're taking the time to talk to them. Um, so when the kids come home from school and we say, how was your day? And they answer, fine, it was fine, right? We don't, we don't get much more than that. Try asking more specific questions, right? Things like, what's the best thing that happened today? What's the worst thing that happened today? Who'd you sit with at lunch? Did you, you know, did you meet any new friends in, or meet any new people in your math class, right? Asking more kind of specific questions is going to be easier for them to generate a response than how was your day? Fine, right? We want to make sure as busy as we are, and we are all crazy busy these days, we want to make sure that we are prioritizing that time to talk to the kids. And it might not be right after school. It might be at bedtime when you can sit there and tuck your kid in and, and have a little conversation. It might be while, while you're prepping dinner or while you're walking the dog, right? It doesn't matter when it is, it just matters that you take the time to do it. Um, third on here is trying to stay regulated. Um, and what does that mean? That's, that's simply knowing kind of where you are in your body and where you are in your mind and making sure that, that it's a good place, right? When we start to get agitated, when we start to get frustrated, when we walk into the house after a long day of work and the kids haven't picked up after themselves and nobody started dinner and, and we're just frustrated, right? We can choose to walk in frustrated and start complaining about everything that's going on, or we can take a second and say, all right, this is not how I want to walk into the house, but I also don't want the rest of my evening to suck either. So I'm going to take a second, do a couple breaths, 
maybe be thankful that even if the house is a mess, you know, everybody's still here. Everybody's healthy and I don't have to drive tonight or whatever. Um, by doing that, by taking a second and regulating yourself, you're not only modeling that for your child, but you're also decreasing the amount of, of time that you feel like crap and that your kids are getting yelled at for maybe something they don't need to be yelled at for. Maybe it's something a conversation can be had, right? So trying to keep yourself regulated and trying to teach your children to stay regulated is really, really important. Setting a consistent schedule. I do a lot of executive function training for kids, for teens, for families. Um, and this is, this is usually the starting point, right? What are we doing in the course of a day? How much time are we spending do, doing these different things? How much time do we want to be spending doing these different things? And then building into a schedule, right? Start with bedtime because that's, that's the time that we really want to make sure stays consistent. What time do we want to wake up so that we're getting and that our children are getting enough sleep so that they can have a healthy body, so that they have all the, um, you know, the mental wherewithal to deal with school and stress and everything else? How much time do they need in, in general for homework? How much screen time do you want your kids to have? How much family time do you want to build in to the day, right? And then you start to build it out and see what you have time for, okay? The second thing I usually talk about in executive function training is keeping everything where, where it should go. Um, this picture on here, I think, would be like lovely and awesome. Um, but if you guys are anything like me, there's way too much stuff that would have to be crammed into that closet to make it work. And that's okay. It doesn't have to look like Martha Stewart pretty. But we know where the kids' shoes are. We know that there's a hook for everyone's backpack, purse, or briefcase, right? We know that uh, we keep the dog leash by the door so that he doesn't have an accident while we're looking for the leash. Um, lunch bags, right? First thing you do when you come home, pull the lunch bag out and you bring it into the kitchen so that it can get cleaned out. Um, knowing where things are so that you're not spending a whole bunch of time stressed out looking for things can go a really long way towards de-stressing. Building resilience. So all the research shows that resilience or grit, as some people call it, um, is really the, the quality that makes the difference between uh, person A and person B go through a traumatic experience. Person A has built resilience. Person B has not. Person A is going to get over said traumatic experience quicker and with less difficulty. Person B is going to struggle a lot more and for a lot longer time because they don't have this quality that we call resilience. So how can we build resilience? So there are five, um, five pieces of the resilience puzzle that we wanna talk about. Um, the first is increasing positive emotions. So most of what we've been talking about are really ways to decrease your stress, right? And on the flip side of decreasing our stress is feeling good. So doing things like having a, a consistent schedule, knowing where things are, having 
quality family time, having time with your, your spouse or your partner, having time with your kids, like these are all things that will naturally increase positive emotions. Um, engagement or flow. This is the sense of being so into something that everything else kind of falls away. So you get the same, you get the same kind of experience as you do doing mindfulness activities. Um, building positive relationships that builds resilience. Um, we have great opportunities within the home to build beautiful and strong relationships with our kids. We also want to make sure that we're helping them build relationships outside of the home. Um, we want them to, to be able to, to foster friendships. And as they get older, um, you know, different types of relationships. We want them to know that there are other trusted adults out there. Um, this goes a long way because if you have a support system around you and something happens and tests your resilience, right? You know that you have people that you can rely on. You know that you have people that you can go to and say, hey, I'm really struggling. This thing happened and you know, what, one of the things as parents that maybe we don't want to think about so much is we'll get into fights with our kids, right? We'll have power struggles, things will happen. And we want to make sure that our kids have people out there that are safe, that they can talk to when they're mad at us, right? We want to make sure that they have opportunities to go to a trusted individual, you know, whether it's a friend or a friend's parent or a, a teacher or somebody to be able to say, hey, I can't talk to my mom right now because she's just being horrible, but this is what's going on, right? Really, really important that, that we help our kids build those relationships. Meaning, um, Having something that's meaningful to you, to your child, is one of the foundations for building resilience. You have to care about something, right? We've got kids running around that, that their parents say they just don't care about anything, right? How's a child that doesn't care about anything going to build skills like resilience, right? So we want to make sure that we're finding those things, helping our kids find things that they do care about that are meaningful to them. And then finally, a sense of accomplishment, knowing that you did something, that you completed something, that you helped someone with something, it feels good, right? Just, I like to make lists just so I can cross stuff off and be like, yes, I finally got something done, right? I have a sense of accomplishment for that. Um, that builds resilience. So, okay. Um, so an activity that you can do with your kids and your, your partner, spouse, whatever, friends, coworkers. Um, see, name five things that bring you joy, right? So a couple of mine are on here. This is my puppy, Thor. He brings me joy constantly, he drives me nuts too, because you know he's a puppy, but he really brings me joy. Uh, my family brings me joy. Snuggles bring me joy. Chocolate, not gonna lie, bring me joy. Um, ask yourself, what are some things that bring you joy? These do not have to be these giant, profound, you know, intellectualized ideas, right? It can be like colored pencils that smell good, bring me joy, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as you can identify what brings you joy. And having this conversation with your kids is not only very educational, because we, when we ask questions like this, we really do learn a lot about our kids, things that might, have surpri might surprise us. Um, 
but it's it's important for your kids for them to learn to think about things like this because when we're having a bad day when we're struggling you know we're we're talking about not knowing what's going on, getting back into school, transitional times, all these things that, that breed stress. Here's something that you can use with your kid in the moment. Yeah, today was a really rough day, wasn't it? It sounds, sounds pretty icky. Hey, remember when we talked about things that bring us joy? Let's, let's look at those right now. Let's think about what were those things? Oh, Mario Kart. Yeah, that brought you joy. What else was on there? So now your kid is talking about things that bring them joy instead of the crappy, sucky day, right? So really nice, fun way to increase positive emotions. Engagement and flow. So this is something that you probably have a fairly good idea about your kids where they get this. This is the thing that they're doing when you call their name three times and they don't hear you, right? Chances are it's a video game. And you know what? Right now, that's okay. We want to foster other types of activities that give them that same sense of engagement. But we want to acknowledge that, that yeah, they're really into something, which means other stuff, other stimuli is not affecting them. That's, it, it's like the idea of, of being able to escape, right? You're having a bad day. Maybe you go and curl up with a book and, and read something to get your mind off of everything, right? This, this is what our kids are doing. Um, personally, I find Legos to be my, my favorite activity to do um, when I just want to de-stress. Sometimes I color. Um, doing puzzles, gardening, those are other things that um, I find that I get that, that kind of sense of engagement from. So ask yourself, what are some things you do where you feel like the world just kind of melts away and you're totally immersed in that thing, right? Identify those things for yourself and then talk to your kids about that. Hey, I notice when you're, um, when you're drawing the, the manga cartoons, right? Um, when you're drawing those, like, man, it seems like you're really into it, right? You, you'll, you'll be able to identify those things. Positive relationships. You probably know who you have positive relationships with, right? It's probably an easy list to make, but sometimes it's really important to remind yourself of them, right? Particularly if you are in a situation, say, say work is crazy and everybody is being like, like middle school drama crazy at work and you're there all the time and you're dealing with all these people Take a second, close your eyes and think about the people that really, really matter, right? Because the work people, they don't really, really matter, right? Think about the people that you truly have positive relationships with, relationships that are bi-directional, right? Not just that you love this person, but that they love you back. Um, so hopefully that's family. Hopefully there's, there's some friends in there, you know, and this is also something that we want to talk to our kids about, you know, oh, little Johnny was mean to you on the playground. Oh, that's really rough, man. Who, who are some friends that were nice to you today, right? Who are the people that make you feel good when you play with them? It's, it's really important for our kids to be able to think in those types of terms. Sense of accomplishments. Um, again, this is, I think we, we all can agree that uh, feeling like you've got something done 
um, it, can, it can be a super, super powerful feeling. You know, those are like the days at work where, where you accomplish something and you feel really good about it and you drive home, you're like, yeah, I rocked it today, right? Like that feels so good. So we want to talk to our kids about that too. Here's some things that I'm proud of, right? Here's, here's something that I finished. Here's something that I'm good at, right? I think if you can talk to your kids and, and ask them those questions, right? What are you good at? What's something that you've finished? What's something that you're proud of? Man, what a gift to give your kid just th th this list of ideas that bring positivity to them. And think about it for yourself too. What's something you're good at? What's something you're proud of? What's something that you have finished that you feel good about? Meaning or purpose. So again, this is, you know, the thing that, that when everything else falls away, that you have a sense of meaning, right? I think for most of us here tonight, raising our kids, right? I think that is um, one, one of the most kind of fundamental purposes we can have, right, is, is having our, our children, raising our children, turning them into, you know, good, productive, happy, healthy grown up someday, right? That's, that's, you know, pretty purposeful. Um, think about other things in your life that give you a sense of meaning, or a sense of purpose. And talk to your kids about that. These are things that are bigger than me. These are things that are bigger than our family, right? Or, or our family's immediate needs, right? These are things that really, really matter. Um, kids need to be aware of um, the, those big things, the, the things that kind of make us tick in the background. So there's um, a piece of research out there that looked at resilience building and tried to kind of come up with like that one activity that can foster like all five of those resilience building um, processes. And they realized that playing games does all of that. So Family game night can build resilience for everybody. It elicits positive emotions, right? It's a fun thing. You're having fun. It fosters positive relationships, right? You're sitting with your family. You're having fun together. There's a sense of meaning because there's a purpose to the game, right? Whether that is to climb up all the ladders and avoid the shoots or it's to you know, keep the vampires from overruling your village or whatever. There's, there's a, a, a purpose to a, to a game, right? There's a sense of engagement because you're all working together for a goal. Um, it builds problem solving skills, executive function skills. It gives you a sense of accomplishment. Right, so all these great positive processes that in academia we talk about, like, oh, we need to do more of this. Right, we can do all those things by playing games with our kids, and that's pretty awesome. Um, so I wanted to spend the rest of the time answering questions. Melissa sent me a lot of questions ahead of time. So I'm gonna hit those, but go ahead and type in or raise your hand um, to ask additional questions. Um, let's see here. So some parents were asking about how to adjust to all day school, particularly when the kid's younger and maybe only had half day school before or was in some sort of weird 
partial remote hybrid something, you know. Um, the first thing is you want to you want to talk about it ahead of time. You want to let them know what it's going to be like. The more information you have ahead of time, the better. Um, you want to go over the schedule so they know what to expect. They know they're going to be getting up at seven o'clock and having an hour to get dressed, eat breakfast, feed the fish, and get in the car, right? They need to know what to expect. What's, what's school going to be like? Okay, well, you're going to have circle time. You're going to have lunch time. You're going to read stories and talk about the calendar, right? Here's what it's going to be like. If you can, try to meet the teacher ahead of time. Try to meet a friend ahead of time that's going to be in your class. Um, before school starts, if you can, and I know it's most of us school has already started. Um, but if you can start your bedtime and wake times about a week before school starts and their bodies are ready for it. Um, how many kids out there spend the first week of school exhausted when they, when they come home from school and they just like pass out on the couch, right? Their bodies aren't used to it. Um, it's a new schedule, it's new stuff, and it's overwhelming their systems. So if we can do that, if, if we can get them ready for it ahead of time, that's going to help. Especially for little kids, practice eating your school lunch, right? Make a, a school lunch for them, what, you know, what their lunch is going to be like, or if they're getting hot lunch at school, you know, give them an idea of what that's going to be like. Make sure they know how to open their juice boxes or the Capri Suns or the, the cheese sticks, right? All those little packages and those little fingers, like we don't want to send them like straight into frustration zone. So make sure they know how to do those things. Um, and expect that they're gonna be absolutely exhausted um, the first week or two. Don't, don't plan stuff just yet. Um, so some people were asking about like, how much is too much change? And I kind of want to flip that around and say, well, how much is staying constant? What's not changing? Because we want to be able to focus on that, right? Um, if it feels like everything is, is changing in this kid's life, then really spend some time thinking about what are the things that are remaining constant? What are the things that they're still going to have, right? Um, we're still living in the same house. Your bedroom is the same. Um, mommy's still gonna tuck you in every night, you know, even though you're gonna be going to school like a big girl or you're going to be, um, you know, with a babysitter after school for a couple hours or whatever it is, make sure you're talking about the things that are not changing also. Think about your child's resilience level. Um, if they're a resilient child, they can handle a lot more change. Um, what are the emotional perceptions of the change? And this is really, really important. I think a lot of us in the past year and a half have kind of looked at all of the changes and all of the uncertainty and been like, oh no, what are we going to do about this? How are the kids going to, are they going to be okay? Right? If we looked at that, at, at, at the same circumstances and said, huh, how exciting all these changes, right? We don't know what to expect. I wonder what's gonna come next. And we just talk about it a little bit differently. We're saying the same things, you know, um, but we're kind of looking from, from a, a, a wonderment and excited point of view instead of a stressed out, worried one, our kids are gonna pick up on that. Um, so we wanna be really cognizant of how are, how are we emotionally looking at, at the changes that are occurring? Um, how much time is there to adjust? 
if we know that in three weeks the school schedule is going to change okay we have three weeks to kind of work our way towards accepting that and getting ready for it if we find out that tomorrow the kids are all going to um, have to wear a plastic bubble to school right that that's going to be a little bit crazy right we have no time to to prepare for it um, and then along with the emotional perception of the changes, how are you presenting this to your kid? Oh, I'm really sorry, it's gonna be so hard, but you'll get through it. Or, oh my gosh, you'll never believe what we're gonna be doing now, right? Very different ways of looking at the same kind of situation. All right, so um, somebody asked how to prepare your child for preschool. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> all of all of the kids are they're they're going to go in and they're going to be okay. Um, you want to give them as much information as you have. This is your teacher. Um, he or she is is going to be very nice. Here's what they look like. You know, maybe we can go in and meet the meet the teacher, see the classroom, let them know what to expect. Um, somebody else asked how to help my child build trust in their new teachers. Again, it goes back to letting them know what to expect, right? Setting the expectations. And again, modeling excitement, positivity, and trust. If you're nervous about them starting preschool or you're nervous about them having a new teacher, they will pick up on that and they will be nervous too. If you are excited about their new teacher, if you are excited about them going to preschool, chances are they're going to mimic your emotional state. All right, <laughs> so what if they don't mimic your emotional state, right? What are the signs that they're really struggling to cope with changes or with transitions, right? So some of the things we might see are acting out behaviors, like being sassy or talking back, being oppositional, saying no all the time, right? Being moody, tearful, or sullen, coming home and just going, oh, I'm just going to go to bed, right? Um, significant changes in sleep or appetite, changes in homework completion. If you have a child that typically does their work and really has no, uh, no issues with forgetting things or finishing them, and all of a sudden they've got all these missing assignments, right? that's a sign that there is something going on. Um, a decrease in joy over previously fun activities. So you have a kid that has played soccer since he was three and loves soccer. And now he's going, well, I don't really want to go. Do I have to go? Right? Something's going on. Anytime you see a significant behavioral change, that's when you want to find out what, what's behind it, right? What is going on? Um, while we are on this slide, I got some more questions during the day, so I will go through these now. Um, so somebody asked for tips on dealing with defiant behavior and talking back, telling parents no all the time when asked to do things like homework. Okay, so every behavior has a reason. It's our job as parents to be detectives and figure out what that reason is. Why are they telling you no? Is it because they're struggling with something? Is it because they're exhausted? Is it because they are at a certain developmental age where no is not, it's not appropriate, but it's normal, right? You have your, your two to three-year-olds, right? They are for the very first time in their existence exerting selfhood, right? So they will say no. They're supposed to do that. As a parent, it's annoying. But developmentally, it's exactly what we want them to be doing. Teenagers, same thing. 
we need to know that they can say no. And we are the first people they practice that with. If it is something that is important, if it is a family rule, you're gonna sit down and discuss that, right? Expectations, consequences. Here are the rules. If you say no, if you don't do it, this is what the consequence is going to be. And maybe we're removing screen time. Maybe we're taking away car keys. Maybe we're taking, um, we're taking friend time away. Um, but the, the, the idea is figuring out where the no is coming from before you can decide how you're going to deal with it. Um, how to help kids that did remote school make friends in person. My daughter just transferred to a new school as a first grader and was remote last year. Okay, first thing is the kids, the last 18 months, as crazy as it has been, is what is normal for the kids, right? This has been their experience. So the kids aren't going, oh, I had this very different experience in kindergarten. I wonder if, if first grade is going to be okay, right? They're going to walk into first grade and there's going to be little people just like them and they're going to build friendships, right? And this is obviously for a neurotypical child. If your child has social anxiety or if your child is on the spectrum, right, they're going to have some more difficulties with developing peer relationships but we're gonna help them with that, right? The teachers are, are, oh my gosh, what our teachers have been able to do and the, the last year and a half is nothing short of, of miraculous. Um, the teachers all know that our kids haven't had the best socialization experience over the last two years. They're gonna facilitate that in the classroom, guaranteed. Um, and then the other thing would be just communicate. Talk to your talk to your kid, you know, ask them to come home with three new friends' names, right? When you're in first grade, like, oh, everyone's my friend. Well, what are their names? I don't know, right? So um, ask them to, to pick three people and ask them their name. Communicate with the teacher. If you think that your child is struggling with developing peer relationships, talk to the teacher. You may have a very different sense. Um, than the teacher does. Uh, forgetfulness, distractions, and remembering tasks. So this is the executive function training. Um, using timers, using schedules, using calendars, um, using apps. We have all these tools at our disposal to help ourselves and our kids develop executive function skills. Um, use, use those things. If it's really bad and you need some outside help, there are a lot of ways to get executive function training. Um, a lot of schools have executive function groups for kids who are really struggling. Um, you can call somebody like me and come in and do executive function um, training. There are groups, there are books, there are workbooks. There's all sorts of resources out there to help with those skills. Um, how to help my child cope with feelings of isolation, jealousy, and frustration when friends are doing things I won't allow. Oh man, that's brutal. Um, so there's there are always going to be kids who can do stuff that our kids can't, right? And acknowledging that is really important talking about the reason that you choose to have certain rules can be really helpful. Talking about um, individual differences is really important because unless otherwise told, kids will assume that, that everything is the same and equal, right? So we need to, we need to explain to them that you know, in different families, in different households, in different cultures, in different geographic areas, you know, like things are different. 
And what's right for one person isn't necessarily right for another. Our job as your parents is to protect you and make the best rules and, you know, um, you know, expectations and consequences that are best for you. And that's why these are your rules. It's always going to be hard when the other kids get to do something that your kid can't. Um, and, you know, we want to, we want to acknowledge that. Uh, school started already. And um, this child is complaining that the days are too long and it's too hard. Um, so first acknowledge it, right? Validate their feelings. Yeah, school is hard, but it's also a lot of fun, right? Um, make sure that they're getting enough sleep. If they need to rest after school before doing activities, that's fine. Make sure that they're getting um, enough nutrition throughout the day. A lot, a lot of times kids will not eat their lunches. So their blood sugar drops. And then you have like, you know, just all sorts of like wonky energy. And uh, we want to make sure that, that again, that we're setting their bodies up for success. So good sleep, good nutrition and exercise. If your child is doing all of those things and you've gone a couple weeks and they're still like exhausted, then I would talk to the pediatrician, right? But chances are it's a transitional thing and there's, they're not getting something that they need. Um, okay, I've got a ton more here, but it looks like we're, we're running out of time. Is there anyone that wants to ask a, a question? I see a chat. Uh, what do you do when your teen doesn't want to participate in family games or activities? Bribe them. Explain to them that it is really important to you that they participate and they don't have to do everything, but maybe pick, pick a few things that are really important. You know, maybe it's grandma's birthday party and um, it's really important for you to, to have the whole family there. And if they do that, what, what is something that would motivate them, right? Maybe they get to have um, some friends over the next night to hang out in the yard, you know, um, talk to them about it. You know, kids are so, they're so quick to say, no, I don't want to do something. And a lot of times they don't even really think it through. It's just their kind of like MO. So if you have a discussion with them and they still are opposing it, um, you know, I, I think that, that trying to work with them and, and come to a common agreement will not only like solve that they're doing something with the family, but you're also, you know, showing them how to problem solve, how to negotiate, you know, these are life skills. So that, that would be my suggestion for that. Um, is there anybody else that wanted to ask something or make sure I get to? Melissa, is that the only the only thing in the chat? That's all I saw. Okay. Um, can we take more time? I can answer um, some more of these that came in, or what's no? We can take a few more. Okay. Um. So let's see, what's a good one? Um, what suggestions do you have for children who need to go through the IEP process? Any specific suggestions for children who aren't autistic but have sensory processing disorder? Um, so there's a lot of sensitivities. 
So the best that you can, you want to change the environment for the student. If they are um, ultra sensitive to sound, get some noise canceling headphones. If they are ultra sensitive to light, um, maybe get some glasses that are tinted that, that can make them more comfortable. Um, if they are craving certain types of input, you know, same thing. If you've got a kid who really needs deep pressure um, and gets anxious if they're not, you know, having having that um, that sensation, then make sure that you're putting them in clothes that are snug or that they have like um, maybe a heavy duty uh, vest or something that that they can wear. Um, schools are are really good for the most part about accommodating kids that just need a little extra here or there. Um, if it's an IEP, it's gonna be written in um, so that, that the child gets whatever is in there. But if, they, if you don't have an IEP or 504 accommodations and you know your kid kind of just needs X, ask for it. You know, and for the most part, like if it's if it's something that the school doesn't have to pay for, um, and they don't have to have an individual providing it, then usually it's not it's not such a big deal. Um, the effect of masks on kids, um, I think, for the most part, with neurotypical kids. Um, parents are more worried about it than the kids are. The kids roll with the punches. They are um, naturally resilient, as we've been talking about. Um, there's, there's no data that the masks are hindering developments. There's um, no data that says that the uh, gas exchange is harmful in any way. So, you know. Kids are going to do what, what the other kids are doing, so that sh it shouldn't be as, as much of an issue as a lot of parents are, are worried about. Um, obviously, if your child has sensory issues and it's very uncomfortable for them, then you want to work towards finding a solution that's going to work best. You know, they've got a lot of different types of masks out there, um, you know, so... That's my thoughts on that. Um, let's see. We had a couple come in today. Um, oh, anxiety in young children. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of anxiety these days. Um, I think teaching body awareness is really, really important for anxiety. Um, we want our, our kids to be able to identify all the different feelings, whether that's like hunger and thirst or fatigue or restlessness or anger. Um, all, all of those sensations and emotions can be felt in the body. So we really want to work with our kids to make sure that they understand and, and can label what their experience is. Because once they can do that, it's a lot easier to, um, to work with the symptom. Um, teaching your kids calming techniques or mindfulness techniques are really important. Um, a super quick and easy one is five, four, three, two, one. Have your child name five things they can see, four things they can hear, three things they can touch, two things they can smell, and one thing that they can taste. By the time they're done doing that, they are in the moment, they are in the here and now, and they are not worrying about whatever it was that they were worrying. Um, so that's just one example of, of a good calming technique or, or mindfulness activity. Um, deep breathing, blowing bubbles is really good, especially for the little, little kids. Um, and then cognitive strategies. You know, as, as the kids get older, um, really asking them like what they're worried about and like what's, what's, 
what's the possibility that that this thing is actually going to happen or you know what are the chances that this this catastrophic event that they're worried about is going to happen okay and if it does then what right how what 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 do we do about it um and problem solve from there so um I think I'll I'll stop talking. It looks like people are are dropping off. Um, thank you so much for listening. If anybody has questions, you can reach me um, at Marvelous Minds. The website is right there. Um, you can reach me through the website. And thank you. Melissa, are you still there? Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Oh. Did you not hear anything that I just said? No. <laughs> All right. My, well, what I said, I didn't think I was muted. I can't tell. Um, but thank you for coming. My, Keyboard and mouse all of a sudden are not really interacting with Zoom for some reason. It will interact with everything else. But um, I wanted to drop in the chat the link to the registration for next time, but I can't do that now. So anyway, it's September 28th, and the topic is talking to kids about LGBTQ+. Yeah. So hope to see all of you there. Send us your questions. And thanks for coming. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night.